Hello? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Kendrick, and I think this is the first in-person seminar I've been doing in a while. <laughs> so it's my great pleasure to introduce Farouk Golban. I, hopefully the people on Zoom can hear this. There are some, there's actually more people on Zoom than uh, currently in person, but maybe that'll change. In any case, um, Farouk's here for uh, the week, uh, I think through Sunday. Uh, he's visiting CMRR for the first time. He uh, comes from Maastricht University, and there's a strong history of collaboration, as many of you know, between CMRR and Maastricht. Um, he got his PhD at Maastricht in cognitive neuroscience, I believe, in 2020, fairly recently. Um, Farouk and I uh, collaborate a bunch over the last two, three, four years. He's very technically uh, savvy. Um, his uh, his research is, has been in auditory cortex and MRI and developing analysis methods to process especially very high resolution uh, MRI data. Um, he's recently become more interested in fMRI and maybe that's where his next research projects will go. Um, he knows a lot about the brain and neuroanatomy but also MRI physics and certainly programming tools and making tools available um, to others to help analyze the sort of bleeding edge of uh, high resolution uh, MRI data. And let's see. Oh, and his uh, PhD advisor, I missed. I'm just ad-libbing this, uh, was Federico Martino. And uh, Farouk is currently employed at Brain Innovations, which is the company that is responsible for Brain Voyager. So he interacts closely with Reiner Goebel uh, at Maastricht. And yeah, I was, a, as, as Christoph briefly mentioned, uh, Farouk's here for a, a little uh, sort of lab workshop that I'm organizing, but this was a nice excuse to kind of get Farouk over here just so we can meet with him. And I think he's very happy to meet with anyone who uh, wants to meet, uh, talk more extensively about other topics throughout this week. So please let me know or let Farouk know. Um, and he's more than happy to discuss with you. Okay, that was a long intro, but without further ado, here is Farouk. Let's give him a welcome. Okay, thank you, Kendrick, and thank, thank you, Kami, Kendrick, and Christoph for organizing this talk. I'm happy to be here, finally, <laughs> after some years. And yeah, Kendrick said that I am working at Brain Innovation Maastricht as a software developer and researcher, also collaborating and being affiliated with, uh, oh, the mask, yeah, I can take off my mask <laughs> with the Maastricht University. So, okay, a few years ago, when I was writing my thesis, I have stumbled upon this almost forgotten German book <laughs> that says uh, the angioarchitectonic aerial structure of the cerebral cortex, written by Richard Arvet Pfeiffer. I don't know how many of you heard this name in 1940. So, I found this book in a secondhand uh, bookshop, basically, and bought it. <laughs> it was not available on the internet and started looking at the pictures. There are more than 100 pictures inside. And fascinatingly, uh, there were pictures such as this one, like uh, this guy, Pfeiffer, sectioned lots of macaque brains, and then looked at the angioarchitectonic structure of different areas within the gray matter. And he delineated some borders. And he even did it for the whole macaque brain, you can see that this is one of the pictures that's available in the book that shows for the whole cortex, the areas that Richard Ar Arvet Pfeiffer delineated. And this was to me surprising because when we think about the brain structure or neuroimaging uh, in the recent years, like we think about myelination based differences or cytoarchitectonic differences between areas and try to parcelate the whole brain based on this. But I was not really thinking that there would be angioarchitectonic aerial differences within the cortex. From this, I got the insight that there, there could be these differences. So let's hold this thought in like the side of our minds. And then around the same time, I was also looking into high resolution uh, in vivo uh, MRI examples. Um, and of course, like there are lots of post-mortem work there too to explain where the contrast is coming from in the in vivo data. And I was lucky enough to have Valentin Kemper around in Maastricht, and he was acquiring this T2 star weighted images at 0 0.35 millimeter isotropic resolution at 9.40 at that point. And he just showed me that 
you can get very nice images that show the three of genera and some other vascular structures in the visual cortex. So I was again like fascinated by it. But at that moment, I was working with Federico de Mart Martino during my PhD. And we were, of course, interested in the auditory cortex. And I looked into the literatures, checking the, what is available in the auditory cortex. And compared to the visual cortex, actually, there is not much available. There are some really old and rare, like uh, post-mortem images, and like basically showing some structures in the auditory cortex, delineating some areas. So I was thinking, hmm, can I do high resolution anatomical imaging at the auditory cortex? But at the same time, I also realized that, well, most people do it in the visual cortex. So what I should do is to do it in both areas, both auditory and the visual cortex, to make sure that the images I get is uh, in good quality compared to the literature while extending it to the auditory cortex in vivo. Which brings me to the data acquisition part. Uh, and luckily, this paper is recently published in NeuroImage. You can find more details there. So for the data acquisition, we planned two sections, uh, two sessions, two like one and a half hour sessions, basically, using 70 MRI at Maastricht University's Connexus facilities. We had five participants. And in the first session, we only focused on 3D multi-echo GRE using the SPI protocol uh, made available by uh, Corbinian Eckstein and Simon Robinson. And in this session, we have recorded 0 0.35 millimeter isotropic images, like Valentin did at 9.40, but now I'm doing it with Demo Evo now at uh, 70. We had six echoes, we had bipolar readouts, and each run take around 15 minutes to, uh, to finish, basically. So that we had a little trick here, which some of you might be curious about. That was 90 degree phase encoding direction rotations. And I will circle back to why we did this uh, in the next slides. We acquired some whole brain MP2 rage images just for registration purposes. And in the second session, we acquired the same mesoscopic resolution. And mesoscopic, I usually mean below 0.5 millimeter isotropic, although there are different uh, definitions I know. In the second session, we acquired MP2 rage images that are really optimized for not for quantitative T1 purposes, but for like a good enough resolution, at good enough contrast at this resolution that kind of purpose, and also fast, just to get our uh, like tissues defined or segmented to do further analysis. And on the right side, you can see our coverage, which is roughly the one third of the brain covered in these sessions. We had multiple echoes. We derived uh, S0 and T2 star images. And also, uh, for the segmentation purposes, T1 weighted like uni and later T1 images for the MP2 rage data. Our pre processing was quite straightforward. Uh, basically, to pull up our SNR, which was not too much at 0 0.35 millimeter isotropic resolution, we, our uh, idea was to just register them and average the data, the whole session to get good images on the right. And third, you can see that our images look pretty nice. So nothing complicated in terms of uh, analysis here. So now I'm kind of, I will move towards this 90 degree phase encoding rotation stuff that we did and explain why we did it. So here is the data quality of our multi-echo GRE images. This is some of all echoes. So all six echoes just summed together across runs. And you can see that this is before co-registration, so there is some head motion here. And we all know that head motion is a bad thing. We need to account for it right before uh, averaging the data further. But even though when you do perfect head motion correction, there is still something else moving in these multi-echo GRE images. And let's have a look at this uh, GIF. So let, let's see what is moving here. Well. Uh, First of all, this is a maximum intensity projection across 0 0.35, uh, sorry, 7.35 millimeter along to Z direction, just to highlight this white stuff. And this is some of all echoes again. And you can see that this white stuff is moving around quite a lot, actually, quite substantially. And you can also see that the brain is actually not moving. It's the same at the same location. However, this white stuff is moving. Well, this white stuff is mostly arteries. If some of you are familiar with the, where the major arteries are in the brain, 
And you can see that only thing that I am changing between these two images is the readout and phase encoding axis directions by 90 degrees. So, so this uh, might bring some of, like make some of you think about like maybe, oh, why didn't you use flow compensation to account for this flow effects and so forth? Well, we couldn't use it because we were aiming to acquire multi-echo GRE with six echoes. And as far as I know, you cannot really do flow compensation for more than two echoes easily. Uh, so we had to do like no flow compensation, but then do this 90 degrees phase encoding direction rotations across our acquisitions, which we had to average together to pull up our SNR anyway. So we did this extra thing. And at the end, we have used a little <laughs> Hollywood movie making trick actually to get rid of this moving stuff because you might see that like, I would like to analyze the cortical stuff like inside the cortex, the Andrew architecture. But if I have these uh, arteries moving their signal around, if I'm unlucky, and I am unlucky because I'm interested in the auditory cortex, which is surrounded by really large arteries, I might end up having gray matter chunks that are affected by this artery signal that is very bright. And if I don't account for it, it's my this might lead me to like infer my signal uh, incorrectly. I might say that, oh, there's like a little bright island in the gray matter that is maybe due to myelin and, and so forth, but actually it's not about myelin. It's just the arterial signal being spatially misencoded uh, towards the gray matter. And like a more complete explanation of this phenomenon is available. <laughs> the most recent paper I could find on this topic is from 1990 by Ehman. Uh, uh, Kelly and uh, Verley, where they really explain uh, how this artifact works and how to manipulate it. So we had this 90 degree shifts you can see in the red and green areas here. The phase encoding axis is different. And the funny thing is this artifact depends on the phase encoding axis actually, not the direction. Uh, you can do like a 180 degree uh, change, but the artifact will occur like more or less the same way in the same direction. Because uh, in, in a simple way of saying it, like this artifact exhibits itself as the vector component of the blood flow along the readout axis. So maybe it's a bit too much to think about right now, but basically you can see that there is the, um, like the guest blood flow based on the artifact, of course. And then you can think about the readout axis that is orthogonal to the phase encoding axis here. And then you can see that the, the displacement happens along the readout uh, axis direction. And when you switch 90 degrees this axis, you have a very different impression of the arteries. And the neat trick is that once you have these two images and which like you have to average them together anyway to uh, increase your SNR. You can do a little trick here uh, that I call compositing, which is just taking the minimum of the signal. Or voxel by voxel, you look, and then when there is this bright signal, you just take the minimum signal from one of the runs. You don't average them together. And doing this basically gets rid of the, this motion that, is, that we don't want. At the end of doing this compositing, now we can do T2 star fitting. And in our T2 star, uh, maps, what we end up seeing here, you can see a minimum intensity projection, almost four millimeter in uh, depth. And you can see, we see lots of vessels. And the thing to remember is that the arteries now look dark too, because we kind of mitigate the arterial signal through this 90 degree phase encoding directions, the rotations, and then compositing to get rid of the blood motion artifact. So, okay, now, uh, Aside from this uh, blood motion stuff, I would like to focus on the uh, quality of the images to maybe convince you that we did good processing and good acquisition. So here you can see our uni images from mp 2 reg protocol that I have segmented based on four regions of interest that, that were around uh, focused around macroanatomical landmarks. That was the calcarin sulcus in the both hemispheres and the Heschel's gyrus, where the primary auditory and visual cortices are. 
And I have only did a good segmentation there, spent uh, extra effort to make sure that I manually edited and guaranteed that it's a, like a really good control segmentation. And now these borders that we see in blue and orange delineate the gray matter borders. And now I can see inside what's going on. So just to show you that in this subject, I can easily see the, let's say, three of January, although there's a little question mark whether it's really the three of January or not. I will come back to this point later. And nicely, we can see some intracortical vessels that are penetrating through the cortex. Um, also to convince you that this is not only a single subject where we have good images. Here, here is like some extra subjects from the paper and th there's more in the, uh, in the paper, more figures in the paper. You can see that we can consistently see the, this dark stripe in the calcarine surface. And also these thin tubes that are penetrating the cortex in many of the participants. These are the intracortical vessels, of course. So just one parenthesis on this little tubes or sticks, dark sticks. <laughs> I believe these are actually mostly veins because we are looking at the T2 star contrast. And they are mostly the, the fourth and the fifth classes that are like classified by Duvernoy. Because in most cases, I see them penetrating through the whole thickness of the cortex. And in some cases, they penetrate through white matter and then continue. So I think we are basically capturing class four and five intracortical veins at 0 0.35 millimeter isotropic resolution. Okay, so hopefully I convinced you of the image quality a bit. And now I can go back to the further analysis because actually this is the, to me the exciting part. Just getting images and looking at them at is, is something, but then what do we do with these images? Um, and here I would like to mention uh, like a major effort, a, a COVID effort actually, and that we spent together with Renzo Huber to develop these um, like highly optimized for mesoscopic imaging tools that is available within the software suite called Laning. It's free and open access. You can find the repository here. And I would like to emphasize that these are all original C programs original algorithms, like we are not wrapping around free circle or calling some functions in brain Voyager. No, these are all like original algorithmic development that we did together with Renzo Huber mostly, and then implemented in C++ and made available. And also my purpose was to analyze my own data, basically in the way that I really wanted to, to guarantee like the highest accuracy and precision. There are lots of uh, things to discuss, like why we went to this way or instead of using some of the available tools, which I will not get into now, unless if there's like a discussion uh, after the talk. But basically what we are doing is that we are doing everything in the voxel space. We are not using triangular meshes at all, which is the standard basically. So it's easy to use. You are always in the nifty space, voxel space. But there's also a, like a cautionary note there, like we can only do it because our images are now at really at the mesoscopic resolution, which means that below 0.5 millimeter and even like further down, which is at 0.35 millimeter. Um, if you have 0.8 millimeter or 0.7 millimeter images, I do not recommend to use like uh, some of the things that I'm going to show you here directly on that resolution because they are really built for when you have like maybe 10 voxels inside the gray matter. You can see lots of explanations like lay, lay people explanations in these two websites as blogs. These are kind of the like the lab notebooks in a way that we keep with Renzo while developing stuff. And if you really want to use it, we make it quite accessible by providing some tutorials. So you can just follow the YouTube page and see how to easily apply it. On the right hand side, you can see something actually very important that you need to take account for at the mesoscopic resolution. That is computing the cortical depths following box equi volume principle. You can see that this is a data from DING 2016, some post-mortem T2 star imaging, T2 star weighted data. And you can see that the yellow middle gray matter um, 
band versus the green one is quite different. And the green one fits to the biological nature of, the, of this dark stripe in this area much better. Just to say that, yeah, uh, this equivalent principle matters at this resolution, and you should really use like programs and algorithms that has equivolume principle embedded in the cortical depth ca calculations. We can do other nice stuff in Laney. For instance, we can have a chunk of uh, gray matter and then they quickly delineate some columnar structures, although these columns are geometric columns, like not neurobiological columns, columns here, just to note. And the part that I'm really excited and had to work quite a lot <laughs> to get it right was the parameterization of the whole gray matter chunk part that I'm going to like use today in the rest of my talk. Briefly, what we do here is that we basically use the cortical depth calculation from this program, LN2 layers, that follows the equivolume principle. But now to, to, to really parameterize the gray matter, the whole gray matter chunk, not just a surface, it's like a 3D folded chunky stuff, basically. Um, we use this LN2 multilaterate program that is a set of original algorithms developed to basically parameterize this little chunk. And what it does is that it gets like a little chunk of gray matter. And once you use it, and once you use another program called patch flatten, you can basically project this folded gray matter chunk into a like a Petri dish style uh, data that you can easily browse through and explore what's going on. So just briefly, although I will not go into too much details, what it does is that it basically operates on the middle gray matter definition and through like using a set of geodesically computed distance measurements and some like operations between them, it can parameterize quite straightforwardly the, the geometry, folded geometry, which then later can be used to basically unfold the cortical gray matter. This is very important for doing uh, human brain research because human brains are very convoluted. And sometimes like when looking at the animal brains, I wish that we had less convolutions and this is a way of basically getting rid of the, the convoluted part. <laughs> Hopefully that can make us like more easily explore and like arrive to new thoughts about the gray matter. So now as a result, um, that is available in the paper to these, these figures. Here we can see one subject's calcarine sulcus that is delineated by this line. So there are different uh, directions denoted as superior, uh, superior, posterior, and so forth. And here I am looking at a superficial gray matter, like layer or depth. And here you can see that the actually, even though I segmented out the veins and arteries quite precisely in using T1 weighted images or T1 images that's called mp 2 rich I can still see some impressions of the pile uh, veins or, or arteries, but I think they are veins. And these are basically due to veins, if I'm thinking correctly, like distorting some other voxels around them so that even if you segment them out in your anatomical image, like when you look at the T2 star data, they, they, the effects of these things will still be there. So you should be careful when doing high resolution imaging and looking at superficial layers. It's not easy to get rid of the vein effects just by like erasing voxels. And finally, if I have a look at a cut through this like little pancake or petri dish and like raise it and look at it from the side, I can see some of the penetrating veins that I showed before that is traveling through the cortical thickness. Okay, just to convince you that this is not a single subject like a phenomenon, like these are the other, other subjects and consistently you can see these dark impressions. And actually Kendrick has a paper in 2019, I think, that shows in the fMRI data these dark impressions too. Um, and the point here is that, yeah, like even if you do good segmentation in the superficial layers, you will not get rid of the effects of the large veins. However, it's not that these veins are everywhere. So there are lots of areas where you do not have this large darkening. And those areas might be better to have a look at what's going on in the superficial layers, maybe. So this is the Heschel's gyrus uh, point of view. So before it was calcarine sulcus, now it's Heschel's gyrus. And you can see that in actually some subjects, 
posterior to the Heschel gyrus, there is this large vein. But it's not always in the posterior part. Sometimes it's in the anterior part. So like maybe knowing this information, the, the pile Andre architecture can give us some insight in the future about how the maps would look like, uh, or maybe what tricks we can use to, uh, to mitigate the pile large uh, vein effects. Okay, the other part that I'm really excited about is actually uh, more towards the inside of the gray matter. Here, you can see two regions of interest from one subject, a calcarine sulcus and Heschel's gyrus. And now what I did here was to, throughout the cortical depth, I used the med median operation so that these two these slices here just shows us the median projection, the median value projection along the, the cortical thickness. And finally, I can see lots of these dark spots. And these are the intracortical veins that I showed you before. And now, interestingly, I can start like detecting them, almost like a peak detection algorithm in 2D, and then maybe figure out a way to quantify this mesoscopic intracortical penetrating vein density. And who knows what they can be useful for. Like my plan in the future is to basically do fMRI on top of it and see like the spatial effects that are maybe going on around those intracortical veins, like, or, how, or how do they affect like the maps that we de derive from fMRI measurements or other sorts of measurements. And funny, like this is of course nothing new. Uh, Duvernoy showed, although in a much like, higher resolution, that there are these penetrating arteries and veins and they might have some geometric relations in terms of the ratio that they have like one to six or one to three or, or whatever. And my thinking about here, although it's like open research direction, is that if I am sure that these are all veins, maybe there's a way for me to kind of figure out the Goldilocks zone of penetrating arteries, even if I'm not seeing them. And maybe have a look at the signal behavior along these different uh, regimes, different artery or vessel, penetrating vessel, uh, artery or vein penetrating dominating regimes, the fMRI signal. And just to show that this is not only a single subject again, in all of our subjects, maybe not so clear in this screen right now, but it's available in the paper if you want to look at the details. Uh, like we see these dark spots at 0.35 millimeter IO strip resolution. So I think we can really do this vessel density uh, or vein density estimates. Of course, one uh, part that I didn't mention is the head motion. I forgot to mention, like we, we selected participants that are really experienced in uh, participating at 70 MRI studies. And we didn't do something extra to account for the head motion. Of course, if we are thinking about using such method in a clinical population, we need to address the potential head motion issue in a much more like a controlled way. But for now, we just use good, good participants. And they, we got some good images that we can see these penetrating veins at 0.35 millimeter resolution. And their apparent uh, diameter is at 0.35 millimeter resolution. Okay, this is the Heschel's gyrus or calcarine sarcus Heschel's gyrus. You can see that there are lots of these uh, dark spots. Okay, now circling back to the cortical angio architecture idea that I had from. Uh, Richard Arvet Pfeiffer's 1940 work. Uh, so, so far we explored the cortical landscape, but now I would like to compare like more in a more traditional way, the layer profiles between different areas. So here, imagine I have these four areas, I have segmented them, I have generated some petri dishes of, a, of the like set diameter that was in 30 millimeter in diameter, I think. And I have these little like folded pancakes I can do layering inside using lane, and then I can generate these layer profiles. And now here the animations automatic, automatically cycling through different subjects, just to show you that the, the patterns that we see are quite consistent across subjects. So what, what do we see here? We see the T2 star on the Y axis. The X axis is a little bit complicated, but quite useful. We have the equivolume cortical depth. So this is all gray matter, this middle part. The blue vertical line signifies the white matter line, and we see 
a bit below white matter line too. This is done on purpose just to see like the dynamic range of my cortical signal. Because I think it's important to plot not only the gray matter, but also what's a bit below and what's a bit above. So for you to get a better feeling of the dynamic range. And above is the like above part of the gray matter where there's lots of CSF and vessels mixed into the uh, mixture. So on the top row, we see the Heschel shares right and left. And the bottom row, we see the calcarin sulcus right and left. And what you might realize is that there is this relatively strong dip in the calcarin sulcus. Some subjects are really like apparent than the others. But in the Heschel shares, like such dip is not so clearly visible, at least at this 30 millimeter in diameter cortical chunks that I'm now plotting here. Maybe if I would have looked at the smaller um, windows of the Heschel shells, I might see different patterns, but now I'm just keeping it the same between calcarin sulcus and Heschel shells. So usually, I also like, I have a question for you <laughs> to hear feedback later. Like usually people think in terms of like the myelination and uh, other types of like maybe fiber orientations that some years ago we looked together with Christoph. Like they, they reason always about this myelin stuff when they see different cortical uh, contrast within the gray matter high resolution data. But now I'm questioning, since I see these veins so prominently in, our, in my T2 star images, this darkening that, that penetrates through the uh, cortex, I am now asking what part of the contrast, this aerial uh, gray matter profile differences that I am seeing are coming from myelin versus coming from angio architecture? It's a, it's a question. Like if some of you have an idea, I'm happy to talk. Like, is it really like the myelin differences that I am seeing here between calcarin sargus and Heschel's gels, or am I seeing different cortical angio architectonic differences um, that, that are giving rise to this T2 star effects? It's quite strong T2 star deep around the middle. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> hopefully I will figure it out at some point or if you have some ideas. So now I would like to move to the future directions part of the talk because like, I, I try to throw in lots of future directions here because I am here for the next week and I'm happy to like, discuss with you. So this is Sebastian Drespa, a PhD student. He's looking at the uh, particle the laminar signal across wall and vaso across different stimulus directions, but the combination, uh, like now he started to combine the mesoscopic anatomy data that we, the same protocol actually, 0.25 millimeter T2 star imaging, together with fMRI, where he segments the large veins in the pile and intracortical parts, and then also have a look at the different signal changes for bold and vaso in collaboration with Renzo Huber too. And basically this goes back to my idea of like combining the high resolution anatomy with fMRI and seeing some like investigating the spatial nature of the fMRI signal. Like how does it behave around the pile veins? How does it behave around the penetrating, uh, mesoscopic penetrating veins and so forth? What is the resolution of your I believe here is 0.8 millimeter isotropic. Um, so vaso data that gives uh, bolt uh, automatically. Kind of. So this is work in progress. The other direction is actually a bit more on the uh, like analysis side. So we can develop now through this nice flattening method that we have that's convenient to use in the voxel space. We can develop some geodesic filters. For instance, one application that is done by another PhD student in Maastricht, Alessandra, is that she computed for the uh, MT, motion sensitive area MT, and she had an experiment where she shows um, different motion directions to the participants and get some like, preference map. And the question, and also this is, of course, supervised by Reiner Goebel, his interest is to quantify the columnarity of these maps. And one thing that we did is that since we have the parameterization of this uh, little chunk, we can basically go through the voxels or set of voxels like a searchlight-like algorithm and then check in some determined parameterized cylinders, like how many of the cylinders is filled with the same type of category to kind of quantify the columnarity that we have. Like, are they really columns or is it like half a column? Is it no? Is it no columns? And 
basically we can convert these preference maps that is gained by the fMRI experiments into some scalar maps that shows us the amount of like some spatial structure and even do some fancy visualizations to see the spatial pattern who again survey the cortical land landscape using the fMRI data. Another direction of this geodesic filter is actually to do data denoising. Here you can see that um, I have my T2 star data, maybe one of the participants, which it was a bit more noisy. And once I have parameterized this cortical uh, folded Petri dish, I can use the same type of geodesic filtering idea, but now use it to denoise my data. Like here, what I do is just simple median filter. So like imagine that some pancakes of a predetermined size moves around the cortex, and then I just get the median value in that pancake. And once you do it yeah, at these parameters, whatever it was when I did it, you can see that I'm getting a much nicer visual of the cortical layers or, or angio architecture or myelin architecture, whatever you want to call it. So this is inspired by some work that is done in MGH, I believe, that they have like different types of filters, but they use it on triangular meshes. Here, we use it on directly in the voxel space using this new LN2 multilateral algorithm that's implemented in Laney. Another future direction is to use all these tools that are developed for the mesoscopic in vivo imaging in like other types of mesoscopic imaging. For instance, big brain project, and there are many other like data sets that become available recently from Amsterdam to, uh, no, not Amsterdam, like Pedro Bazan's group. And basically try to combine all this cortical, like surveying of the cortical landscape across different data sets and having a look at the, like the cortical profiles and other patterns. And for instance, interestingly, when I did it for the big brain data set at 100 micron isotropic resolution that is publicly available. So I went to the, uh, the occipital cortex and I grow a disc, a really large one here, and then I flattened it. And finally, like what I see is that these white spots now, and these white spots are basically, I believe are the penetrating vessels. So this circles back to the idea of quantifying the cortical penetrating vessels. Like if I have some estimation from the in vivo T2 star images, and if I want to check how good is my estimation compared to some ground truth, maybe like was to some extent, big brain can give me this ground truth so that I can find these little uh, white spots and see, oh, at 100 micron, I can see like uh, 20 penetrating veins per 10 millimeter in diameter geodesic disk. And then compare how well I'm doing at the in vivo MRI regime. Yes. No, it's it's not MR, it's uh, histology. So we do we see cell densities here in this data. But funnily, even though it's done to see the cell densities across layers, at really, I think it's 20 micron actually, the original resolution. But it's not easy to work with, so I use the 100 micron here. Like the funny thing is that there is like a hidden information there, I believe, which is the these empty spots that are left behind from the uh, veins. And now I can use the same tools that I have developed for the in vivo MRI data to have some estimate of the, what it should look like at 100 micron. Um, and I think this, this feature was kind of hidden. I think so, I heard some people like talking about it, but I don't remember anything coming out. Maybe there was one work who tried to do like a vessel detection, but it was all in 3D. Now we can do it in folded space that is much easier to understand for us. And like just have a look at the image and see what type of patterns are there uh, and arrive to some new thoughts, hopefully. I'm getting to the end, uh, almost 37 minutes. So th there's another exciting direction, <laughs> which is I think not explored at all, at all in the past. By using this voxel-based parameterization approach and combining it with some, uh, like a, a different way of treating the data structure, like a bit beyond whether you have voxels or whether you have triangular meshes, I, treat, I can treat the data as point clouds, which means that I have these vertices basically that you have in the triangular meshes, so, but I don't have the connections in between. So once I have these point clouds, I can move them around in space 
which in a way is like in a thinking way that it's basically taking the data from an Eulerian perspective that's in the grid and putting it into a Lagrangian perspective that you move with the like th there are basically points in space that can move around in floating point precision. I can start having a look at my data in many different ways here. I mean, just a bit of a joke also. I do it like cakes, uh, rise it and see through the laminar patterns, or I can slice it like a weird pizza with three slices. I can do it um, like so, like I can raise it like a cake and then rotate it and see, for instance, here, uh, maybe there's like a little uh, area here that is dark, see? And I might already get some like visual exploration insight that what could be there so that I can start thinking about building more quantitative ways of yeah, quantifying these aerial uh, like differences. Maybe it can give me some insight about what size of window that I should choose to find uh, such like aerial differences in whatever data that I have. Hopefully it's not too abstract right now. <laughs> or like th this one that I like, if you really see some nice laminar patterns, you can do this staircase plot and see through the cortex. And I, ju I just imagine, although I don't have the data yet, I imagine like it would be so cool to have some fMRI activity and then plot it on the anatomy and cut it like this and see like not only a single slice in the convoluted brain that is really hard to understand what's going on in terms of laminar activity, but like really have a more co cortical landscape survey type of thinking to see what's going on. Well, that's the <laughs> that's the end of it. I hope it was not too scatterbrained, <laughs> but I will be around for the next week. So please get in touch with me. I thank uh, to all my co collaborators and acknowledge Federico, Martin, and Benedict uh, for the earlier parts of this project. Um, and uh, we collaborated a lot with Kendrick and discussed a lot of ideas. We did the imaging part mostly with Dimo Ivanov. And then Saskia is an expert in angio architecture in general. So I really like discussing with her. She, she does like time of flight, uh, really high resolution time of flight uh, imaging. And Conrad, uh, like he gave me lots of pointers about the big brain data set and it's really useful to talk. And of course, I would like to acknowledge Reiner as my boss. <laughs> it was always exciting to talk to and he like really supports all our efforts at, in Laney together with Renzo. Actually now Renzo left Maastricht, but maybe he will be back at some point, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah, I mean, that's it. <laughs> Questions. Any questions or questions on the from Zoom? If you guys want to uh, put them in the chat, I can, uh, or if you let me know, I can uh, unmute you. If I can ask uh, a couple of more questions. Uh, you know, this idea of, of putting a functional image is not specific on. The idea of putting all the functional images on top of this uh, incredibly uh, detailed high resolution um, uh, anatomical images is wonderful, but of course it would be great to have the functional images at least at the resolution that you are working with uh, in the anatomy. And, uh, and of course at seven Tesla, they are not uh, quite there yet. Uh, it's a comment, but um, maybe you can you know, comment on that comment. And the other other thing was when you showed uh, the very first image of uh, angio architecture on the on the um, monkey brain, that was uh, that was sort of interesting. Of course, in the sense that when you look at it very uh, superficially, I mean, I didn't have time to examine it, but very superficially, it looks like uh, some of the other. Uh, you know, maybe myeloma architecture maps or other kind of maps. So it looks like there's there must be, I guess it's not surprising, there's some sort of a correlation between Andrew architecture and um, uh, the rest of the, I mean, uh, other kind of architecture maps that we've seen, myeloma architecture, myeloma architecture being one of them. Uh, yes, thanks for the questions and comments, Karen. Yeah, 
yeah, I'm actually, <laughs> I'm hoping to, I was hoping to excite some of you so that if you already have some really high resolution fMRI data in your uh, fancy ultra, ultra high field scanners, I would be like happy to collaborate and figure out ways to visualize them. Uh, of course, like uh, I kind of do, like we do seven, we use 70 data and overlay it on the really high resolution anatomy because that's like what we have right now. But one reason actually why I did T2 star imaging is to also have a have some sort, sort of a perspective of the future of fMRI since it's a T2 star weighted contrast to, to a large extent. Like this multi-echo GRE is like a really optimistic, <laughs> like a T2 star weighted imaging in a way. And I actually have a part that I didn't show here, but I am planning to kind of simulate the EPI images using the T2 star maps that we acquired at high resolution anatomy and compare it with the empirical T2 star EPI images to have a, like a better feeling of what sort of artifacts are there and what sort of distortions are going on. So I hope this like addresses part of the comment. Yeah, yes, we need 0.35 millimeter fMRI. <laughs> And I think Ramzo is already working on it too with, uh, with some other groups. The other part is that, yeah, this uh, correlation between Andrew architecture and Milo architecture. Yeah, I think there is some correlation. I was just surprised to not really see this idea of Angie architecture too much mentioned in the literature. For instance, reading uh, Bob Turner's uh, book chapters, he is always talking about like basically all sorts of architectures and how you can use them to parcelate the brain. But I, for instance, didn't see him really talking about Andrew architecture. Uh, this was like one curious uh, insight that I had. And, I, and, and also like, it's kind of funny because, yeah, I mean, most of the high resolution brain imaging work is done in dead brains, right? Where there's no blood or it's, it went away. But we want to do it in, in vivo, where the blood is moving, pumping all the time. So we need to, my, my feeling is that we really need to go there at really high resolution in vivo imaging, uh, anatomy first, for me, more important, and then see what's going on. That, that's partially related to the blood motion artifact. Like if you want to acquire these images, we need to really understand what the blood is causing in our images and like account for these effects. And also don't forget about the, yeah, like the blood because we want to do in vivo human brain imaging ultimately. Not dead brain imaging, I guess. <laughs> I'll just there's a comment from from Cheryl. It says for the for the question of whether the mid layer contrast is due to angio architecture or myelin, why not both? During development, elaboration of the capillary bed increases the synaptic density increases, so perhaps the two are spatially separable until we get down to tens of microns of resolution. So yeah, yeah. it could be yeah. I mean, if someone has like a full perspective on it, I would be really curious to read more and discuss more. I think it's totally possible. I just, my point was that I really didn't see it like explicitly discussed, uh, like the relation between architectures in many ways and the Andrew architecture. <laughs> and of course, like one other related idea is that if there are these strong Andrew architectonic differences between layers, what does it tell us about the, layer fMRI signal detection. Like if we just have like a higher density of a certain diameter vessels in, in one layer versus not the other, uh, having the same delta T2 star change between activity and baseline, we might end up seeing like some laminar significant uh, di different like activity, but this might be just due to Andrew architectural differences, but not really some neuronal effects. So I was also curious about that part. If anyone has some idea, I'm like happy to hear more and discuss. Here's a question from Mike. Uh, could you do a similar study with T2 map or T2 bold and T2 bold? Uh, what T2 bold? T2 map and T2 bold. Yeah, I we had this comment from a reviewer, I think, uh, like T2. Imaging is, I think, not so efficient to have like this type of uh, high resolution data in high quality. But yeah, I think this could be an interesting direction to go. I, I just had a look at the uh, literature actually <laughs> that I have a little table here. Um, I believe this uh, Buddha is from CMRR actually. Uh, 
like there are lots of T2 star weighted images, but not for the high resolution. This is below 0.5 millimeter isotropic. Like I looked at all the, I believe all the papers. And all of them are doing T2 star imaging basically. And T2 imaging is not done at all. Uh, I think Buddha has some, although I didn't note here. And there are some like weighted images at like mesoscopic resolutions. My feeling was that it was just not efficient to acquire T2 images. Um, but yeah, we didn't try. So maybe this is something to look at. I think Robert Turner suggested some ways to do it. Yeah, that's a direction to go indeed. But I'm I'm curious about T2 star more always because it relates more closely to fMRI. And that's the direction that I want to move towards. So I would like to like really stick with T2 star as much as possible. There is one more question from Xiaoping. Uh, did you use dielectric pads? Yes. Okay. We used. I think I can see them on one yeah. side, the right side, there are two of them. But yeah. It's one on, just on one side, or maybe they were lower on the other side. Yeah, we tried to put it on both sides, but like due to head size differences, if if we couldn't manage, we just put it on one side. But I think in this one, we could put in both sides in all subjects. And then he's asking if you corrected for gradient distortions and radial distortions in your T2 star. No, T2 H. I didn't correct. Um, I didn't correct. And I am not sure why it would be uh, important for what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I was combining data from different scanners, I think that would be important. But right now, I'm not. But if this was the case, I, of course, I would do it. Uh, yeah. OK. Yeah. <laughs> I was intrigued by the, the NGO architecture idea. And I'm just wondering what? What sort of features was he dealing with? Was Pfeiffer dealing with? And are, are they are they extractable, incomputable statistics from your your data? Yeah, uh, I mean he is noting these arrows. For instance, here you can see a little white arrow that delineates like an angioarchitectural difference. Here you can see that there's a very dark sort of like area here, and it is not so dark here. And like part of my idea that is also behind this uh, cortex parameterization is that like, exactly do what you are suggesting, suggesting, which is have a like a parameterized surface that is called a 3D structure basically, and then go through it with some like kernel, geodesic kernel. And then th this is sort of doing it, this work by Alessandra. Like it's, it's a very simple hypothesis here, whether like everything is the same or not. But you can imagine that if I have some templates that I have derived from all pictures, like let's say double peak, uh, then I can use that as my convolution kernel and then pass it through the uh, particle landscape and then see at which areas it is like matching with the empirical data to really quantify in a more statistically mindset, uh, like the aerial differences or what's going on. Yeah. Uh, one comment about uh, you were talking about the fact that yes, the vessel distribution in fact um, can cause functional imaging uh, uh, to look as if there are layer differences. Uh, this is, I think, you know, quite well known, for example, you can always see um, if you, especially in animal experiments where you do a lot of high resolution stuff, um, you can always see, you know, the middle layers uh, very high intensity and the other, you know, other outer layers are not so much. And that predominantly comes from, you know, that picture. I guess to avoid that, you know, you have to look at essentially, um, some parameters that are not just simple functional imaging intensity, but uh, have some link to whatever you are studying, future selectivity, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you about exactly this uh, point that you raised. So you are taking out uh, the blood vessels, but there's something is left you are talking about. Yeah. Right? So a uh, question I had was, how do you take out the blood vessels? Are you looking at like the T1 images and looking at the you know, identifying the luminal boundaries of the blood vessels. Yeah, I am looking at the T1 uh, weighted images basically. And here, like I'm trying to 
really precise the segment the outer gray matter border, like for instance, avoiding this guy, yeah. avoiding that guy. Um, but like the funny point there is that the veins are not visible in T1 weighted images, most of them, or the smaller ones, which when I switch to T2 star contrast, all of a sudden like these, uh, these like, for instance, look here, uh, or that maybe that's a part of an artery, but like for instance here, there's like something lying on the bottom that is not visible in the T1 weighted image. So this was more of a, like a, like a uh, observation or, or a realization that, or oh, maybe like just relying on T1 weighted contrast and thinking that I just segment out the way, like veins and arteries is not so easy at higher resolutions because they will be coming into focus when you use a different contrast other than T1 weighted. Okay, I don't think there's any other questions on the chat. So let's thank Fark. Let's thank Fark again. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs>